Welcome to the U.S. Healthcare System Lecture Series by Monica Wahi. Based on Essentials of the U.S. Healthcare System by Shi and Singh. Welcome to Chapter 6, Financing and Reimbursement Methods. You don't have to memorize all these complicated formulas that we will talk about in this lecture. But what you do have to memorize is moral hazard. Because moral hazard is the reason for all of those calculations. Chapter 6, Financing and Reimbursement Methods. Learning Objectives. At the end of this lecture, the student should be able to explain why provider-induced demand is a moral hazard, as well as name and describe at least one of the parts of Medicare. The student should also be able to describe at least one reimbursement strategy used in insurance and finally describe at least three efforts to increase health insurance coverage for children by way of public insurance. Effects of health care financing and insurance. Let's first start by looking at insurance, its nature and its purpose. What is this moral hazard we are talking about in the U.S. health care system? Well, let's go and follow the money. Let's start with the financing. Someone has to pay for health care because most people need it. In fact, throughout our lives, everyone will eventually need it. So we find a way to put together that money and give it to insurance companies. Those insurance companies then turn around and set two things up. One is they set up access to services. They pick providers for us that we can go to and they set up contracts with them. Also, once we go to those providers that they lead us to, they then pay them for us. So the financing goes to the insurance and then the insurance sets up the providers and also pays them if we go there. And that is how we get healthcare expenditures. So where's the patient, right? And where is the money coming from? Well, that's where the moral hazard is. It's because the money's not coming from the insurance. You don't see an arrow that way. The providers aren't paying, they're getting paid. So where is the money coming from? Well, ultimately it's the taxpayers if the insurance is dealing with a plan that's a public insurance plan. And it's you and your employer if you have health insurance through your employer, but ultimately we're all paying for the situation where the insurance gets to set up where where we get to go and who we get to see and what gets paid and we don't really have any control in the middle. So let's look at what are the effects of the moral hazard. On one hand, the providers are getting paid, but on the other hand, the insurance is telling them what they will pay for. So the insurance is basically working with them to give them money. And the person in the middle, the patient, how do we know it's what they need? So the financing of health insurance doesn't actually really come from the insurance companies. I mean, they do pay them, but where do they get their money? They get money from public sources like Medicare and Medicaid to pay for those insurance health plans from private sources like you and your employer. And that enables us to go to these providers. So think about it. We can't control, we're not in the diagram, we as patients, it, we can't control this relationship between the insurance and the providers. So therefore, the providers can say, hey, I want to buy this fancy technology because it's cool and it makes my patients want to come here. And the insurance goes, well, that's good because then the patients will try to get our insurance because they'll want your technology. So I'll reimburse for your technology. But of course, it's not very attractive to go somewhere to just, you know, have a cold. And so things that are, you know, maybe not the kind of things that attract patients, like you know, nutritional counseling. Would you run off to the clinic because you heard that? Or what about that robotic arm or that fancy new um, genetic test that'll tell you, 
you know, if you're likely to get breast cancer or something like that, well, that's probably more attractive to the American culture. I'm American as well. I'm very attracted to all that technology, even though I realize that, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner of the slide, that it's just a party between payments from insurance to providers and tech. It's just a big party at our expense because every time we buy one of those fancy things I would love to have used on me, maybe we won't be able to pay for me to go to the emergency room if I have abdominal pain. Total health care expenditures are greater in this model than if the same services were to be paid by patients, and it's easy to see why. We would all get sticker shock. We would love the fancy tech, but we wouldn't see ourselves as being capable of paying for it. However, we somehow find a way to pay for insurance, and that takes care of paying, care of paying for the tech, and that's why it gets bought. So let's go back to why we even have insurance because from the last few slides it looks like insurance is just this corrupt entity that's sucking our money and not giving us health care. Well I worked at an insurance and I'm a pretty moral person and what I was thinking was what was on the slide. I was thinking it makes more sense to share risk because just like you can imagine if you have a big community not all of you are going to get in car accidents, so why not be part of an insurance where you all put money into the pod and if somebody does get in a car accident, you can take care of them. So substantial final financial loss from some event is what risk is. So why not pool our money and protect people from risk? If you are called an insured, an enrollee, or a beneficiary, you are all being called the same thing. You're a person protected against this risk. So if you have a community that gets together and puts their money together to take care of people whose houses are, for example, destroyed in a tornado, because when a tornado comes through, it doesn't destroy everybody's house, but it will ruin your community even if your house is still standing. I know. I was in St. Anthony when the tornado came for in the 1980s, right? And so we had to protect our community against these risks. And if you actually had tornado insurance, then you could have called yourself an insured enrollee or beneficiary. Underwriting is the science behind the risk. If we did want it to get together in our communities and make a pool of money that we could use whenever there was a catastrophe for one of our community members, how much money should we collect? How, many, how often is that catastrophe predicted to happen? These things are worthwhile questions because we do want to know how to protect everybody in this pool without just wasting money and without not having enough money. So underwriting is that science. And then the premium is sort of what comes out of the underwriting. It's the amount charged each month for insurance coverage. In general, this premium could be paid by an employer. It could be paid by the insured enrollee or beneficiary. It could be paid by the government, but it's a result of what the underwriting comes up with as being the right price. Then you also have the concept of cost sharing, the ways the insured has to pay for the insurance. And that has to do with often premiums, but we all know about deductibles, especially from car insurance or house insurance, and co-payments um, that we have to make with health insurance. But there are also sort of stop loss provisions. In other words, at a certain point, if you've paid, you don't have to pay more in a certain year. But however, this will mitigate the insurance claims that come in because if you have to put some skin in the game, you may not be as likely to make a claim unless you really need it. So far, I hope I've convinced you the concept of insurance isn't a bad one. And in fact, national health insurance is just that. It's on the same principles, which are these. Risk is unpredictable for the individual insured. We all know that because whenever we are living, if we're living in Florida and we hear a hurricane coming, we just don't know what's going to happen to us. We're worried about our community. We're fairly sure that's going to be messed up, but we don't know what's going to happen to us. Risk can be predicted with a reasonable degree of accuracy for a group or population. As an epidemiologist myself, I do a lot of that. I look more at health risk than I look at accident risk the way underwriters do. However, you are um, could be amazed at how well we can predict risk in a group.
not in a person. That's why I, as an epidemiologist, can talk to you about your demographic, what race you are, what age you are, and what your likelihood is of getting certain diseases. I can't tell you if you're going to get sick. Insurance provides a mechanism for transferring or shifting risk from the individual to the group through the pooling of resources. And I think all of us would agree with that at some level. This is a very social justice concept, but even in a true market like we have in the U.S., this is a natural human thing to do. There are several restaurants in a chain, um, not in a chain, but all uh, like along a chain in a um, building near me, and they're all competing for the same people. I go into the different restaurants. A few years ago, they burned down. Even one restaurant across the street held a fundraiser for them because the restaurants want each other. They want, they want to pool risk against something like a fire. They want each other to be there even though they compete. This is a human need. And so we all want to pool our money to take care of catastrophes and risk for our people. In general, that's a natural instinct. The problem is when we get into the details of underwriting, who is paying? How much are they paying? Where is it going? That's the details we argue about when we talk about insurance. Finally, actual losses are shared on some equitable basis by all members of the insured group. This is what went wrong with housing insurance and Florida. If you have a state insurance that covers housing insurance and then everybody's house gets ruined in the pool, you really can't all share the loss is equitably because everybody has so many. Furthermore, it is pretty hard to share the losses equitably in, in a, like I just said, in a pool with a lot of loss, but with really radically different kinds of people in there. If you got super healthy people, you got super sick people, and you don't have a lot of them, there's not a lot of pool there to do a lot of load balancing of that risk. So isn't an entire country one of the biggest risk groups you can have? Isn't that one of the best ways you can do underwriting and really predict risk at a group level and really manage costs if you're going to try and save money so you can pay for it? So now let's move on to thinking about what's going on with the Affordable Care Act. In this situation, individuals are required to have insurance or pay tax penalties. Now let's step back. Insurance already exists and there are all these little pools out there that are being risk underwritten and people are figuring out how much the premiums cost. So now individuals are required to join those pools that weren't in them before. Employers of greater than 50 employees must offer insurance or pay a free rider tax. So employers must help these people get into these pools. Medicaid is now expanded. It's expanded to cover the very poor and subsidize the less poor. And what that really means is those people are now going to get on a health plan through an, a managed care organization, and they're going to join a pool. So these pools are getting bigger. States are now mandated to set up insurance exchanges, so individuals can afford insurance. So some of those uninsured who can't get onto Medicaid but are required to have insurance maybe can even afford it. Those people are going to have to choose a pool to join. There is a sliding scale tax credit allowed for businesses with less than 25 employees, like my business, and then if my business offers insurance to my employees, I'll get a tax credit. This is again trying to help them join one of these pools. It is actually now illegal to de deny benefits to those with pre-existing conditions. This is a new thing in insurance. Of course, underwriting and risk suggests that you do not want to get somebody into your pool who has already had cancer and had it go away. There were way higher risk for a recurrence. So it just makes underwriting sense to say if you get a new person applying for your insurance to get into your pool, uh-uh, you're not allowed in the pool. However, with this new law that says individuals are required to be in some pool, the pools had to open. So now it is illegal to deny benefits to those with pre-existing conditions. So when they come, you got to find a pool for them to jump into. Do you think these changes will work? Let's move on to private insurance. Private health insurance is also called voluntary health insurance because it's not mandatory. 
usually it's employer based through the workplace. So if you've ever gotten a job, especially a low paying one, and you sat down to look at the insurance options in your workplace, were you ever surprised at how expensive it was for you to pay even though the employer might be helping you out by paying some of the premium? There are many different health plan providers, such as in commercial insurance companies that you're familiar with. And then there's also nonprofits like Blue Cross Blue Shield. And then there are places that are self-insured and managed care organizations. So there's all these different kinds of health plan providers that use different principles to try and underwrite the risk. There are self and family plans. This is different on public insurance where each individual is his or her own beneficiary. So little kids have their own numbers. Whereas if you are at an employer and you have a plan for the employer, like a family plan, everybody in your family has the same number. 79% of workers are eligible for private health insurance through their employer, but only 65% take coverage. That's not so bad that not all of them do, because sometimes they're already under a spouse's coverage or they're just young. But this whole low wage thing, that's kind of bad. When you're really young, you can be covered by your parents' insurance. But if you're actually working and you can't actually afford the insurance offered at your employer because your employer's not paying you enough, doesn't that seem kind of unfair? So the cost of employer-based insurance varies widely from workplace to workplace because every workplace is a different pool. Let's think about that for a second. You are one person. Maybe you are healthy. Maybe you are sick. Are you old? Are you young? Are you fat? Are you skinny? Well, your characteristics all come with you when you go jump into an employer pool. Imagine that you go get hired at a new job at a big corporation. Let's imagine that that employer has, was large, something like Walmart or Target. They had a, let's imagine they had a high number of high wage earners. So imagine maybe something more technological like Siemens. Maybe they have more full-time workers. And we're not talking about maybe a coffee house or a place that caters to students. We're talking about a place where people get hired and work for years. But we're not talking about unionized places. So big corporations that don't have unions would make sense, especially technologic ones. And especially if there's a higher proportion of younger workers. Because think about what that pool looks like. First of all, it's a big pool. And so it's easy to load balance risk in a big pool. There's more people working, there's not a union co to contend with, and you've got all these people with enough money to pay for insurance because they're high wage earners. Finally, you've got younger workers, so they're way less likely to get sick. See the arrow going down? These attributes will drive down your health insurance through your employer. So if you're looking for a job and you want low cost health insurance through that employer, shop around for employers who meet these criteria. On the other hand, if you want to invest in our insurance companies, instead look for people like me, small employers. These small, if you have a small employer with a greater number of low wage earners, if you kind of think of like a small business that really caters to hiring college students, you know, something that might be very good for the community, it probably is not going to be able to offer health insurance or it's going to be terribly expensive because these people are part time and they probably aren't unionized. And especially if you end up with a higher proportion of older workers, there are some industries that are sort of waning and the people in them are still in them. And those people, if they aren't making much money and they're getting older, those small industries and those small employers, they really have expensive health insurance. I'll bet you maybe have not thought about when you're shopping for employers that you're shopping for health insurance. But this is one way to look for that. Let's look at five types of private insurance. Of course, we will perseverate on managed care plans, but let me just throw a shout out to group insurance, self-insurance, individual private insurance, and HDHP plans. The shout out goes onto this slide with these four categories. So let's start with group insurance. Think of a group like a society or a union. Once, when I was working for Hennepin County, I was offered dental insurance through the secretarial union. And so that is what a group insurance is. It's through a group that's not your employer. They used to offer major medical plans back in the day. 
And so therefore, plumbers, for example, could go through their plumbing union and get a catastrophic medical plan in case they got hurt, especially at work. This is not as popular as you know, because all of the things on the slide is not as popular because managed care organizations have really kind of become the dominant thing. There's also self-insurance. When I was young, my father worked for General Mills, which is a large employer. What we did with our insurance is we just simply went and got care and the bills were sent to General Mills and they just paid them. So that was self-insurance. The employer was large enough to offer its own insurance and simply pay the employee's health claims. There isn't a lot of that going on anymore either. We have individual private insurance and this was always popular among farmers, early retirees, or those who are self-employed. People who didn't have really any other employer but they probably needed insurance. These tended to be pretty expensive so you had to be making enough money to pay for them. And of course pre-existing conditions and very high-risk people were not eligible. So if you were doing certain things on the farm that were very high risk, you might not even be able to qualify for one of these plans. They tended to be expensive. Finally, we have high deductible health plans. These were relatively new in the late 90s. In these plans, the enrollee pays a very high deductible, meaning that basically the enrollee pays out of pocket for their own care for a while in the beginning of the year until they meet their deductible. This doesn't look like a very good plan, however, there were special provisions made so that people could save money to pay that deductible and get a very good um, interest rate on the money that they saved to pay that deductible. At the end of the day, it still didn't get very popular. So what rules as managed care plans? In 2011, 90% of employer-based health plans were managed care plans. 17% of employer-based coverage was through an HDHP. And so as you can see, they were still running around in 2011, but they just weren't quite as popular. By contrast, 5% of Americans were covered under individual private insurance. And so those people were most likely not working. 5% of people could really afford that. Well, we've already talked in our previous lectures and even now about MCOs. They are health maintenance organizations and preferred provider organizations. In other words, HMO is one way to run an MCO and PPO is another way to run an MCO. But both of them contract with a network of providers. They make agreements about reimbursement and they monitor utilization so that there's not too much. Now let's move on to how public insurance fits into the picture. Remember, that's Medicaid, Medicare, and CHIP. These are the major public health insurance programs, and by public insurance, we mean insurance funded by the government, where services for certain people are purchased from the private sector, for the most part, by government money. The exception is the VA, where the government buys its own services from itself. Public financing supports categorical programs. Remember, in the United States, you don't have to just be in the category of being an American to get health care. Like you, have, like you can do in Canada or Great Britain. The categories that you can be in in the United States and actually get access to health care are certain ones. Like for instance, persons in the category of 65 and over get Medicare. But there is no categorical program for the unemployed. So that makes it so if you don't have an employer for whatever reason, it's a really hard to get health insurance. So that's why we set up public insurance. As you can see, the whole idea is to get these things to work together to cover people who are less likely to be employed and be able to get an employer-based plan, but mainly people who really need it and they just can't afford it. So let's look at public versus private insurance. Let's look at that big yellow portion, which is 35%. This is from 2010. 35% of people having the insurance, because remember a lot of people don't have insurance in the United States, but of the people having insurance, 35% was private insurance through the employer. And then 29% was private insurance not through an employer. And those were the people who were getting individual plans. Then you have Medicaid, which is 5%, not a very big amount, and other public insurance, which probably includes Medicare, and, and that's 26%. And then there was this unknown portion, which I don't know why they didn't tell us in the book, but somehow or another, there's 
more insurance. Let's focus on Medicare for a second. Medicare is enshrined in Title 18 of the Social Security Act. Let's start by looking at Medicare in its first iteration, 1966 through 1997. Let's look at the section that says Part A and the other section that says Part B. Medicare was originally envisioned as hospital insurance. However, whenever you go into the hospital, there are supplemental charges. For example, when you leave the hospital, sometimes you have to do home health care or rehab charges. So Part B was to support that. Remember, in 1966, we had a lot of hospitals and not many outpatient centers. And we also just didn't have a whole lot of the health care subsystems or the big systems that we have now. So at the time, as you can see, in the purple section, cost containment was not really thought about because there weren't as many costs. There was a fee-for-service structure with insurance, which basically meant that if somebody actually did have to go to the hospital and have some procedures, that the insurance was generally billed for the procedures and just paid for it. And so Medicare was set up to do that too, and not really pay much attention to who was charging who for what. Also, in 1966, we did not have the big pharmaceutical industry that we have today. Certainly we had one, and certainly there were drugs, but at the time, the out-of-pocket costs to the beneficiaries for these drugs were negligible. And so, so therefore, it was not originally envisioned in Medicare in 1965 and 1966. This hospital insurance was financed by a Medicare tax, and it pays for hospitalization as well as rehab and skilled nursing facilities, home health care, and for the terminally ill and hospice. The rules are complicated and they involve a concept of a benefit period. You will hear people who have to get admitted to the hospital under Medicare talking about when their benefit period starts and ends. This is the period of time after the initial admission that the patient will get benefits for that admission. Hospital benefit period, <clears throat> when it ends after 30 days, the patient pays a copayment of $289 per day. That was calibrated for 2012 seems like an awful lot of money kind of want to get out of that hospital but Medicare must certify the agencies providing the services as an example home health care so Medicare comes in and actually certifies these providers make sure that they're doing what they think they're doing and then they can apply these rules let's look at the 2008 estimates of the Medicare Part A expenditures so remember these are the hospital costs as you can see, 56% of what was spent in Part A was on the hospital, so that makes sense. And um, the next biggest portion was on skilled nursing facilities. As you can see, 5% was spent on administration, okay, and that's equal to what was spent on hospice. The book also mentions managed care and says 21%, but it's unclear what that really is. Let's look at Part B, which is that SMI. This is also known as Medigap. It covers the gap between hospitalization and necessary outpatient services. So Medicare Part A recipients can opt into B, and usually do, because there's a little competing in the price range. So most of the time when people sign up for Medicare, they don't even think about it. They, they get Part A and Part B, because Part B is supplementary to A. Like I said, it covers the ambulance, some physician um, fees, outpatient rehab, some preventive services, but mainly outpatient hospital services, which we have a lot of now. Um, the, the importance of Part B really has grown because a lot of the things that are needed, um, even if a person does get admitted to the hospital for a small period of time, a lot of things that will be needed pre-op and post-op are really outpatient and would really fall under B. Let's look at this slide again. Now you see in the mid-2000s things are changing. You see that the purple part has changed. Now it says Part C, Medicare Advantage. Well what's that? In 1997 Medicare Part C started. You know how it takes years to get these laws going. It's not really a program that covers any particular services, but it was a response to the calls for privatization for governmental services in the 1990s. 
You will hear a lot in these lectures about the Balanced Budget Act of 1997. Basically, when Medicare Part C was put in place, it was to try and control costs by thinking the way of an MCO. Of course, seniors did not want to just suddenly have their Medicare taken away, so they were given two options, old-fashioned Medicare and Medicare Plus Choice, which is what it was called at the time. So they could do an HMO or a PPO plan with an MCO. In 2003, they, <coughs> they changed it from Medicare Plus Choice to called MMA, and now um, it was revamped to keep the MCOs from withdrawing and other issues. Because imagine, this was a big change for Medicare. Now, you know, Medicare is a federal program, and it was kind of acting like a big employer that was just paying medical bills for seniors. Um, and, and doing that all in a standard way. Well, now it was saying, wait a second, we're paying too much. Why don't we use MCOs? They already exist. Why don't we just pay them to take care of this cost containment? And But then MCOs offer some diversity. And so you had to do some work to standardize all that. So there's some growing pains there. But somehow or another, Part C got implemented. So then we move on to today, and you'll notice that the green portion has changed. Now we have Part D, and it makes me wonder what E is going to be. D stands for drug. In 2003 to 2006, we came upon Medicare Part D. Even with Part C coming on board in 1997, drugs were still an issue. Remember, by the time of the 1990s, many important drugs had been developed. I will even just call attention to one class or, or one condition that was really addressed with drugs in a lot of research, which is high blood pressure. We all know if you keep your blood pressure down, you're at way lower risk for horrible things like heart attacks. But in order to keep your blood pressure down, a lot of people have to take meds and they have to take them regularly. They can't go off them and they can't just run out of money and stop taking them. I would rather see a person play, take their blood pressure meds than end up with a heart attack. So even in the 90s, this was already a problem um, that people needed all these meds because we knew that they worked and they helped health, but they might not be able to afford them. Part D was added in 2003 and implemented in 2006. Now this created two brand new types of private plans that hadn't existed before, PDPs and MAPDs. The PDPs offered drug only drug coverage and they were only available to the old-fashioned fee-for-service Medicare so therefore those people could get their drugs paid for because now they really were out um, and then with the other uh, option when signing up for Part C this could come with Part D and the patient gets the drugs through this MMA so again Part D was sort of getting wrapped into the MCO model of cost um, containment so the take home message of this is all the pressures are toward new Medicare enrollees signing up for Part C and getting their Parts A, B, C, D dealt with through an MCO. And so I say why? Well, you remember that um, earlier slides about the moral hazard. The goal is to get money financing into these managed care organizations, these insurances, so that cost utilization will happen. But the problem is, we did, we've done a good job of getting them in there, but cost utilization isn't really happening um, the way it's supposed to be because of that big um, red jaggedy cloud, that moral hazard which is in the way. Let's just compare Medicare Part C upgrade in 2003 to what it was before the upgrade. Okay, so traditional old-fashioned was good if you dislike choosing because you enroll in A and B and that's all you have to do. And if you want Part D, you have to enroll in it separately. And this is still available to new people coming onto Medicare. They could do what's on the left side of the slide. But then Part C, um, there's some changes now uh, since 2003. But in Part C, uh, MMA in 2003, um, like traditional, they had to choose that Medigap, but then they had all these plans to choose from. We're kind of used to that now, but back in 2003, it was really hard on these seniors. They hadn't had to do that. And then they had to choose things in D, 
um, to enroll in D. And so it was actually pretty stressful. Um, a lot of people needed a lot of help with their Medicare in making these choices. Because all they wanted to know is which of them were going to save them the most money. Like I was talking about blood pressure drugs, some people were on certain ones and so they were trying to shop for plans for those. Of course, health changes. What if they actually unfortunately have a heart attack and then they have other needs, other drugs? Well, do they change plans? It became very confusing. Now let's talk about Medicare Part D and problems that occur with Medicare Part D. First, you start with the deductible. And this goes by the calendar year. So starting in January, for drug costs up to $320 in the year, the beneficiary pays 100%. So I like to give the example of, let's say that you're a senior and your drugs cost $500 a month. That's not unusual if you have a blood pressure drug or a diabetes drug or other types of, you know, maybe cholesterol drugs, and they can easily add up to $500 a month or more. Well, in that case, in the first month, you would have already met your deductible, right? So there goes January. Now, for initial coverage, you, this is the next phase you're in, the drug costs of, of around 300 to almost $3,000 in the year, Medicare pays up to 75%. So let's think about you again. In our hypothetical situation, you're paying $500 a month for drugs. So that means for a few more months, you're going to have to pay in the initial coverage phase, meaning that Medicare will pay 75% of that $500, but you'll have to pay the other 25%. That doesn't seem so bad, does it? I mean, so far, you've only had to pay $320, and now um, Medicare is subsidizing 75%, and you're only going to have to pay up to about $650. So you're riding fine through April, maybe May. But now you hit the donut hole. For drug costs between about $3,000 to about almost $7,000 in the year, you're going to pay 100%. So that's $500 a month for basically the rest of the year. Are you going to be able to pay for your drugs for the last half of the year? If you are able to make it up past the donut hole, then you only have to pay 5% of the cost of your drugs. Now it kind of makes sense to set up a situation that's like this. But the actual cut points with the money make it so that most people who have a reasonable amount of drugs that they have to take fall in the donut hole and they suffer in the last half of the year. That's how it works for the beneficiary. But my question to you is, how does this work for the drug companies? Let's move on to Medicaid. Medicaid is U.S. public health insurance program for the indigent. Look at the slide of 2008 Medicaid recipient categories. What jumps out at you? That big yellow part is unfortunately our children. Most of people on Medicaid are children. So remember when there are political debates about cutting Medicaid, they're basically about cutting aid to children. Medicaid was enshrined in Title 19 of the Social Security Act. Each state has its own eligibility criteria. It needs that because federal law requires coverage for certain groups like low-income elders, blind, disabled, some pregnant women, um, and there's lots of coverage to children in low-income families as I was showing on the last slide but most states have to define their own medically needy categories, um, populations and institutions, those getting outpatient services so they don't have to live in institutions like people maybe with severe mental illness. But there are dramatic variations from state to state because wealthier states have smaller share of cost reimbursed by the federal government and they can tax more of their population to pay for more state-based Medicaid. And what you will find is if you are in the U.S. healthcare system and you grow up in a state with a good, strong Medicaid program, 
you may not realize that other states don't have one and if you move even if you yourself are not on Medicaid you can see the effects in your community of people who are sick around you and just say well I would never qualify for Medicaid because you have to be very very poor here and then you'd feel wow you can really feel it when that's not there there are select federally mandated services for these state Medicaid programs so though they vary from state to state the feds get to weigh in let's look at some of these services because these are services you know that no matter what happens in a state these have to be covered nursing facility services for those age 21 and older and then look at home health services for those who qualify and then there's pediatric and family nurse practitioner services also nurse midwife services as I've mentioned before are becoming more popular because they're very effective in helping women give birth to babies I want to highlight the role for nursing here there can probably be a lot more openings in the future in the nursing field for these kind of roles because they are effective and they're what's needed and they're legislated. Here's some more. Inpatient and outpatient hospital services, rural health clinic services, outpatient laboratory and x-ray services. These must be covered by state Medicaid programs. Let's move on to Children's Health Insurance Program. This is enshrined in Title 21 of the Social Security Act, which they keep adding titles to. This was enacted under the Balanced Budget Act, I keep returning to, of 1997. Originally for 10 years, and now even the Affordable Care Act has extended it through 2015. So we love CHIP. At the time CHIP was created, about 25% of low income low-income kids were uninsured. CHIP was basically created as a part of Medicaid to try and cover more of those poor kids. So federal matching dollars to states who expanded Medicaid to cover kids took place so people states could choose to expand their Medicaid programs by expanding it more to kids. There was the incentive and certain adults such as pregnant women and parents caretakers of these kids. Um, they could set up a non-Medicaid program or a hybrid of the two as well and get the match. And so it was really an incentive to cover more children in your state. And it succeeded. December 2010, 5.2 million kids were enrolled in CHIP. Reimbursement methods. Now let's talk about ways that we can pay for our health care. One system of pricing is called fee-for-service. You just do the service, charge by the unit. The child falls out of the tree, charge for x-ray, charge for cast. So this is more like you think of a spa. You go and you're like, oh, I'll have my nails done, but um, I won't have a facial. So this was common before 1990s. In some cases, insurance limited the reimbursement and the beneficiary had to pay the balance. So um, once in a while, if you had something expensive like an MRI, maybe they would only cover most of it and you'd have to pay a little bit of it. But the main problem with fee-for-service was there was a lot of that moral hazard, remember that jaggedy, ugly, red, scary cloud? That moral hazard caused the providers to induce demand. So remember how I said, well, what about an MRI? That might be kind of expensive. I'd have The patient would have to kick in some money. Well, boy, there sometimes they would really like overdo the MRIs, for example. I have the memory of being in the 70s when I was a little girl and um, a new doctor moved in nearby us and suddenly that doctor was giving us penicillin shots like every you know my whole family every month and we had neighbors who was seeing him because he was convenient and he was giving them all kinds of antibiotics and stuff and then um, one of my friends went to high school with his daughter and we learned that um, he went to jail for fraud or something and I think his wife stole a leather jacket from like Neiman Marcus well anyway that's what kinda went on in the 70s okay so that was fee-for-service then we have package pricing 
or bundle charges, which have gotten sort of more famous nowadays because you can figure out on average how much a bundle of charges would be. When you think about it, every time you're going to give birth to a baby um, in a vaginal delivery, you're going to have certain procedures and it's going to have certain drugs involved, whatever. Why not just bundle up the charges and say on average, this is how much it costs to have a baby right and package deal like an optometrist you know eye exam and glasses this all makes sense because there's certain like clusters of services you get together and so why not you know just come up with a bundle charge then there is procedure based reimbursement so forgetting about whether it's actually a vaginal delivery or you're just getting an MRI or a penicillin shot then they started looking at like procedures like what are you doing you know are you um, removing a mole? Are you uh, putting, um, I don't know, sewing up somebody because they're all like cut up or you know like what are the procedures you're doing and then you can uh, adjust it like obviously if you're sewing up somebody you need you know thread and needle and stuff so you can kind of connect that with the procedure. Already it's just hard to explain right? In 1989 Medicare invents the resource based relative value scale or RBRVs you'll hear this all the time and so that's complex reimbursement form formula involving time skill and intensity to take takes to perform a service right so um, in mental health for instance if you have a lot of experience in um, therapy you get paid more you, you're more valuable RB RVs than if you have less training and less experience right and so what is the procedure code so let's say your therapist you're giving individual therapy well there's a CPT code for that and this is all billing you know this is how to how insurance makes sure if my mental health clinics billing it that we're all on the up and up right that I'm not having a chiropractor do it do the uh, individual therapy right <clears throat> Medicare publishes a yearly fee schedule for reimbursements by CPT code based on RBRVs of the CPT. All right. So what actually happens is insurances, because I've worked at one, sit around waiting for the Medicare fee schedule to come out because we base our prices. We, when we're insurance, you know, I've been everybody um, on s sort of looking at what the Medicare fee schedule is. Okay. And how does that get there? Well, the Medicare fee schedule says in RBRV language what to pay for each CPT if you are on Medicare or if you're a provider billing Medicare. And so then of course other insurances can look at that and go, hmm, we need to set our prices thinking about that. And that's exactly what I say at the bottom of the slide, non-public insurances follow suit. So let's just take a look at this image here. On the way left, you got the MCOs. So these are the managed care organizations, and they offer these different health plans. And remember, you can buy into these health plans, whether you're an employer, whether you're Medicaid, whatever. Anybody, uh, you know, different organizations, different individuals can get them. There are two basic kinds of health plans, the HMO and the PPO. In the PPO, which I'll start at the bottom, providers are paid on a fee-for-service fee schedule. Now that doesn't really make sense because I told you about the story when in the 70s how they were just having a party with giving us penicillin shots. Well, the, that was fee for service, right? Well, what's different here is that these providers are not just anybody, they're certain ones, right? Because before, whatever insurance we had, we could just go to that guy who was in our, um, our uh, suburb. You know, here on under the MCO, I, you know, if I'm on a managed care plan, a PPO, I have to go to certain providers. Why? Because the MCO has made a contract with them and then there's a fee for service under the contract and the contract already limits you know how much you, they can charge. And so as long as I cooperate as a patient and go to the right ones then everything's cool. If you move up to the HMO section there are two things that can go on. One is that the HMO just salaries its own providers. And if I'm correct, I remember Group Health, when I was in Minnesota, Group Health, I think, originally came out of Washington, and it may still be there, but that got kind of big in the 90s. That was our first attempts at a lot of MCO kind of stuff, you know, different models. And in that Group Health, they created clinics, and they hired their own um, doctors, and people had to go there. 
I don't know why they closed. I don't know why it didn't work. I actually worked there for three months in 1989. I worked everywhere, you know, and, and um, it was really cool. I loved working there. But in any case, um, I don't know why they closed. Uh, I guess, you know, we used to joke and call them group death. Maybe that had something to do with it. But anyway, so getting back to HMOs, that's one way to do it, but I don't see that a lot. What I see more of is capitation, which is where the HMO will pay a certain p fee per month per patient that a particular um, practice sees. And so in an HMO thing uh, situation, you would maybe, let's say you had a clinic with some doctors at it, and maybe you had like 500 patients. So they don't come in every day, but over the year you'll see 500 patients. Every month you get paid a certain amount for those patients, whether they're coming in or not. And whoever comes in that month, you got to pay for whatever you're dealing with with them with these this capitation payment of everybody. So those are the two sort of reimbursement, main reimbursement models under managed care. What is really important to learn in this class is these two um, esoteric, retrospective and prospective reimbursement concepts. Because they seem sort of like, who cares? They mean a lot, okay? So let's just think about this. Let's look on the left side of the slide. In retrospective reimbursement, which happened before 1983 for hospitals and before 1997 for other healthcare settings, because they kind of had to work it out with hospitals first. So this is in the olden days. You had these per diem rates, overnight stays. So I've got to have a hysterectomy. They put me in there and you know I maybe have to stay overnight a few nights. And so it's per diem. We had to pay the hospital, right? How do they figure out how much it costs? Well, there's many different ways to figure out how much something costs. I mean, if you budget for your home, it becomes hard. You know, like if you have a car, you don't have to repair the car all the time, but maybe you have to budget a little bit per month, so you have a little pot of money if you do need to repair the car. So it, it just becomes like, how much does it cost to live every month in your life? Well, some months cost more because you have to repair the car, right? Or does every month cost the same because you're saving up? That's the kind of questions you have to have when somebody asks you how much do you cost right so what they would do is this thing which is really simple they would just look back at how much they cost last year so for instance they take maybe all the inpatient days and all the people and all that and divide it on and say oh for each person we served it costs so much money and we expect to serve this many people this year so give us you know twice as much money so facilities could increase their their rates by increasing their costs so if you came into my hospital and I gave you roses and chocolate and all that and it was really expensive then next year I'd say wow I'm really expensive hey I need to charge more this year and you could just see like this is a good way to make stuff skyrocket right so um, prospective is different um, it's more recent. It's part of budget cutting. Obviously, this moral hazard is one that's really attractive if you're going to try and make money in, as a hospital, right? So there's pre-established pre criteria right now used to determine the amount of reimbursement in advance, as I just went over, right? The Medicare fee schedule comes out, and then everybody follows that. It's not like we go, oh, Medicare, we just feel like billing you this. So these prospective reimbursement methods are these four methods at the bottom of the slide here. The DRGs, the APCs, the RUGs, and the HHRGs. And so you're probably going, well, that doesn't that sound like RBRVU? And I'm like, yeah, that's kind of in the same alphabet soup with that. Because, honestly, if you go to a different hospital, even two different hospitals kind of in a rural area that's kind of similar, you're just getting at totally different places. Okay, so how do you boil those two things down into units that you can, you know, standardized units that you can pay for if you're an insurance, that you can, you know, whether you go to a hospital in Florida or a hospital in Kansas or whatever, that that's all equal. Well, it requires quite a bit of complex math and a lot of argument because people are going to care about what goes in those algorithms. They're going to care about what's fair. And so, so far what we worked out is these four things. So let's look at this alphabet soup of prospective reimbursement strategies. Let's start with the red ones, the DRGs, Diagnostic Related Groups. This is for inpatient billing, right? And there's 500 of these, okay? So think about it. That's not really that much. Um, if you went to uh, Walmart and you online and you wanted to buy something, they have a lot more than 500 things. And so when the groups are billing with DRGs, they only have 500 things to bill for. And so it's a fixed 
price, but it's based on certain factors. So, for instance, if you're ordering a pizza, right, you're ordering a cheese pizza, if you put stuff on it, then it costs more. And so, of those 500 things, you can modify slightly how much each of them costs because of different things that happen, especially being rural. If you're rural, it's going to change the equation. Okay, this is mainly for inpatient, right? But other things happen that you have to bill for. So let's look at the the blue section, the APCs. APCs are like DRGs, but they're for ambulatory, okay? And believe it or not, there's only 300 of those. There's only 300 things you can get in an ambulatory setting. But again, factors come into play. So one of the things is you might be able to get um, a cut zone up, but it may matter who's doing it, whether a resident's doing it or a surgeon versus a general practitioner, blah, 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 and how much the reimbursement is for the APC. Let's look at the purple square, the HHRGs. Again, you're seeing a pattern here. This is similar, but instead of being for inpatient or ambulatory, it's for home health. And you can imagine there are fewer of those, 153. And they use what's called an OASIS calculation. Remember how I described there's going to be complicated algorithms to make everything equal. People believe it's fair. Not only is the math going to be complicated, but there's going to be a lot of debate about what factors go in there right and that's the oasis calculation for home health finally we have RUGs in the lower left hand corner of the slide they are similar but you guessed it a different setting they're for skilled nursing facilities and again those places do less than what hospitals do you know fewer things and so they are only have 66 RUGs and they classify um, patient characteristics in a case mix because as if you've ever worked in a nursing home you know that people are all very diverse in their functionality and that changes every 10 minutes practically you know a poor person might get a fall or have a stroke and suddenly they're at a very different level of functioning so you can keep classifying them over and over according to this case mix to try and get your RUGs because a person right after a stroke is going to cost a lot more to take care of this is all this work that we've done to try and figure out how to pay for things, make them equal, and, um, and, and try to do a little cost containment. Now we're going to move forth to how well did that work? National health expenditures. It didn't. <laughs> okay, so let's take apart this slide. At the bottom, you see, we start in 1960. Notice how that yellow line is so close to zero. The end, we end in 2010, but it, today it's 2013. So, you know, I wonder what that line's doing, right? On the y-axis, you see at the top, you've got a 3,000. That 3,000 is 3,000 billion dollars, <laughs> okay? And so when you look at the top national health expenditures, what this means is what got spent on health care, no matter who spent it. Whether you paid out of pocket, your insurance paid for something, taxpayers paid for something, it just changed hands and it went towards health care. Okay? So this is how much we spent on all these years in the US on health care. And just look at that how it skyrocketed. I mean I was born in 1971. Like, I've seen what happened between 1970 and 2010. Like, it just blows my mind. Because I'm not getting sick any differently, really. Like, I kind of have the same problems. And it's so much harder to get health care now, and I can't even afford it. This is a little different slide, but it tells the same story as you noticed. You probably maybe didn't even notice I changed the slide, except it changed color. Well, it's actually a different thing. Let's take this one apart. We're already familiar with what years are on there. But let's look at the left. On the y-axis at the top, there's a 9,000. What does that 9,000 mean? Well, that's actually $9,000 per capita or per person. So think of like there's about, I think the last time I looked, there was about 315 million people in the U.S. So this is like per each of those but what's goofy about the US per capita calculation is a lot of people are uninsured here and so even though it's like evened out per capita those people aren't using the services and so it's like in reality per person using services it's even higher right but if you just like deal with the fact that it's per capita you know eight or nine thousand dollars over on the 2010 side is just like astronomical compared to even in 1990 look at that that was something like three thousand that's like a third so that's the story right 
Um, and here's the per percentage of GDP of our gross domestic product. Again, this is more seen of like who it doesn't matter who does the work in the US. The US produces so much, you know, product and what proportion of what we're producing is is for nat national health expenditures and look it's just eating it up. It's it's going right up. Now remember the cost controls that I was talking about just a minute ago, you know, coming up with RBRVs and doing all that, that all happened sort of through the 1980s and 90s. And, you know, you, you don't even really see a blip. It doesn't seem to really change the trajectory of this line. So that's why I say I don't think it worked very well. Here's 2010. It's recent. Too recent. I'm going to tell you what I hate about this slide. I'm going to start with that because you've already seen all this, right? You might think I'm going to hate that little purple part, admin. I don't hate that. I love that because I'm usually in that. Here's what I hate is the little brown part that says public health. The reason I'm usually in the purple part is because the brown part isn't very big. If this were any other country, any other developed country, that brown part would be taken over the slide. Why? Because public health is all about preventing disease. It's about making people healthier, the population just generally healthier, giving people quality of life. Doesn't that sound great? It's kind of like if you could put something in the water to just make everybody healthier, we'd do it in public health, right? So that's what we're trying to do is we're trying to just cover the population with health. And then if people get sick, it doesn't cost as much. You know, fewer people are getting sick, fewer people are getting cancer, fewer people are going to the ER. Everybody's health is better. Yet, as you can tell by the slide, we don't want to pay for public health in the United States. What do we want to pay for? Look at that yellow thing. Look at that red thing. And that's what we want to pay for. And that's why I end up in the purple area instead of the brown area sometimes, even though I'm a public health practitioner, because there's just simply not enough public health money for me to go out there and prevent your disease. So in conclusion, Although there are different insurance structures, most are now managed care organizations. And although there are different ways to get insurance, those on private usually get it through an employer, and those on public insurance, you know, which is mostly seniors through Medicare and children on Medicaid and CHIP, they go to MCOs to get their health plans because the MCOs are supposed to contain costs. Nevertheless, public or private insurance and healthcare costs is still going up in the U.S. Now that we've reached the end of this lecture, you should be able to explain why provider-induced demand is a moral hazard, name and describe at least one of the parts of Medicare, describe at least one reimbursement strategy used in insurance, and describe at least three efforts to increase health insurance coverage for children by way of public insurance. I hope you enjoyed learning about who pays for what in the U.S. healthcare system and how much it costs. If you aren't hopping mad, you probably weren't paying attention. So let's move on to Chapter 7, Outpatient Services and Primary Care.